Now let's move on to discuss the mechanics of muscular contraction, including the sliding filament theory, the control of muscular contraction, and motor units. When a muscle contracts, it shortens. A single contraction and relaxation cycle is called a twitch. A single action potential invokes a twitch. There is a latent period between the action potential and the beginning of muscle tension, and this interval is the time required for the generation of mechanisms that are needed for contraction to occur. Once contraction begins, tension increases steadily, and tension is the rising slope of the twitch curve. The twitch curve is depicted here on the slide with time versus tension. During the contraction phase, the tension rises steadily and at the relaxation phase, it drops off rapidly. The sliding filament theory. The sliding filament theory includes the following. After the signal to contract comes from the central nervous system and through the peripheral nerve, an action potential spreads over the muscle fiber. Calcium is released and binds to troponin. This alters the conformation of tropomyosin, which in turn unblocks the actin binding sites. Myosin, bound with ATP, binds to actin. It hydrolyzes the ATP, and the released energy delivers a power stroke. This hydrolysis also causes the myosin head to turn and ratchet the Z lines closer together. In the relaxed state, the actin binding sites are completely blocked by tropomyosin. Troponin keeps tropomyosin in place. When calcium is released into the fiber, it binds to troponin, and eventually this makes the actin binding sites available. Next, myosin binds to actin and forms the cross bridge. Binding triggers a hinge-like movement by myosin pulling the thin filament inward. The trigger for muscular contraction. The trigger for contraction is free calcium in the sarcoplasm. This is caused by excitation-contraction coupling, which is the process by which an action potential causes calcium release and cross-bridge cycling. An incoming action potential transmitted through the neuromuscular junction causes the depolarization of the skeletal muscle cell. Muscle cell depolarization leads to the release of calcium into the sarcoplasm from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium release into the sarcoplasm binds to troponin and initiates the contraction of the sarcomere. The Neural Control of Muscular Contraction The central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, are connected to muscles by peripheral nerves. These nerves transmit both sensory and motor impulses. Sensory or afferent information travels to the central nervous system, providing information about the periphery, such as temperature, pressure, and pain. Motor or efferent impulses travel from the central nervous system along the peripheral nerves to the target, for example the foot, to initiate movement. This image depicts the relationship. The neuromuscular junction connects the motor neuron with the myofibrils, and this makes up the motor unit. The motor neurons. These are the neurons that innervate and activate muscle fibers. And the motor neuron and the muscle fiber it innervates is called the motor unit. Groups of motor units work together to contract a muscle. Motor neurons originate in the spinal cord and transmit motor or effector impulses to the target muscle. Motor neurons themselves are divided into two branches, an upper motor neuron, which connects the brain and spinal cord, and a lower motor neuron, which connect the spinal cord to the muscle. At the junction between the nerve and the muscle is the neuromuscular junction. Motor neuron axons connect with muscle fibers via a neuromuscular junction. The axon itself ends at the neuromuscular junction, 
and it's separated from the muscle by a synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine cross that cleft and transmit the chemically converted electrical impulse to the muscle. Motor end plates are the region of the sarcolemma adjacent to the axon terminal. The terminal end of the axon and the motor end plate are known as the neuromuscular junction. Complete muscle contraction requires repetitive excitation. The total amount of fibers that contract within a skeletal muscle depend on the stimulation pulse rate it receives. In order to recruit the entire muscle into contraction, a sufficient number and intensity of stimuli is required. If a single stimulus activates the muscle, it will twitch and relax, and this is depicted on the tension versus time graph. There's a latent period, a contraction, and then a relaxation, all part of the twitch. This occurs because calcium is rapidly pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Repetitive stimulation is necessary to activate the muscle into a complete contraction and to generate necessary force to complete the task. Summation occurs when there's no rest between the actual potentials. Now let's discuss the role of the regulatory proteins tropomyosin and troponin in the sliding filament theory. Tropomyosin blocks binding to actin. Tropomyosin wraps around the actin filament, blocking the actin binding site. Troponin regulates tropomyosin. When calcium is bound to troponin, tropomyosin is placed so that myosin can bind to the actin filament ready for the power stroke. This involves cytosolic calcium. Muscle twitch and tension. A single contraction relaxation cycle is known as a twitch. A single contraction relaxation cycle is called a twitch and a single action potential invokes a twitch. There are three phases. Phase number one, the latent period. There's a latent period between the action potential and the beginning of muscle tension. Phase number two is the contraction phase. Tension is the rising slope of the twitch curve and it's known as a contraction phase. Phase number three is the relaxation phase. The relaxation phase is when the muscle is stretched back to its original length prior to contraction. Muscles need ATP. Muscles require energy constantly. The amount of ATP within the muscle fiber is only sufficient for about eight twitches. Phosphocreatine, along with ADP, can be converted into ATP by the enzyme creatine kinase. When oxygen levels decrease, they will shift to anaerobic glycolysis for energy production. When muscles are at rest, ATP from creatine and metabolism can be converted to ADP and phosphocreatine for storage. When muscles begin working, phosphocreatine and ADP through creatine kinase can be converted to creatine and ATP for energy use. With enough work, muscles will begin to tire or fatigue. Fatigue is a condition in which muscle is no longer able to generate or sustain power. It's influenced by the intensity and duration of activity, the type of ATP source, the composition of muscle, and the fitness level of an individual. Central fatigue includes the subjective feeling of tiredness and a desire to cease activity. In other words, it's the will to continue exercising which can be lost. Isotonic contractions. An isotonic contraction is any contraction that creates force and moves a load. It's characterized by a steady tension 
while the muscle's length changes. There are two types of isotonic contractions. Concentric. Concentric action is a shortening contraction. The external force on the muscle is less than the force the muscle is generating. Eccentric action. Eccentric action is a lengthening contraction. It exerts a force while lengthening and the absolute tension achieved can be very high relative to the muscle's maximum tension capacity. For example, you can set down a heavier object than you can lift. The second general group of contractions by skeletal muscle are isometric. Isometric contractions create force without movement. An example would be picking up a weight and holding it stationary in front of you. And this is due to elastic fibers in the connective tissue which are attached to the muscle. So although the muscle fibers are being recruited into contraction, there is no movement of the object you're holding. 